And then we had Jade Porter join us Hello. on the phone. Jade, do you want to
I think that the consensus has been overwhelmingly, yes, we want to sort of share information, but we need to do it in such a fashion that you know everyone understands clearly what we're, we're getting into. What I didn't make clear, I think, in those emails about, you know, could you please respond with all this information and tell us yes or no to share, is that inherently we should be able to share with each other, right, on an individual level. So um, if, if that does appear to be what you agree to, I mean, is everyone okay with the idea of having some sort of maybe um, password protected access to a list of those who have said yes to all this stuff so that you can go in, like, immediately and, and get access to find one other person that you were interested in connecting with? That's sort of an inherent thing in this, right? We talked about sharing it with outside organizations, but shouldn't we be sharing it with our organizations? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to double check with Dr. Norland, uh, who isn't here today, to make sure that he, he's cool with all this. But I was, I was thinking about maybe a Google Doc that um, would be shared very specifically only with the people who said yes to this, and only would show the people who said yes to this. And so we've got about, I think, 31 responses, which is not bad at all, but I don't want to wait any longer. I want to get those available to be shared with primary children. I think Shriners is interested as well, Rainbow Kids, um, probably uh, um, ISP, um, and maybe a couple of other organizations could express interest, but I also want to make it available to you guys immediately. So I'll follow with Dr. Norlin and we'll work on that right away. About time, I think. Great. All right. So this is um, our, our time in this meeting where uh, if you have concerns or issues with you know, families and kids, that you're working on right now, and if you're running into the barriers, um, you can share those and see if we can kind of crowdsource some ideas for you. So does anyone have anything that they're stuck on and would like to get some input from the group? <coughs> yeah.
that, in fact, their leaders just met this last weekend. So these are brand new um, brochures. They've been around. The SEC has been funding the Parent Center to do these for, I want to say, 15 years. It started out as um, supporting those families that are on the waiting list for services for DSPD, but it really is local support groups. And if they're not in that area, uh, we have a coordinator here that um, connects families with families, as well as many of us are involved in an online group that you talk about special kids or U.S. It's a Facebook group. Many families put together their own little play groups or support groups within their area. And if they're not getting that, if they call us, we can help facilitate those groups and get them going. What was it you ask. Yeah. It is a closed group. I monitor it, so I really do. I'm very strong. Many come on as um, they're trying to promote their businesses. So if they are solely on there to promote a business and they're not a parent of a special needs child, then we do not let them on. There's also some others out there that are that are quite popular. There's Utah Kids that they can get on. There is another closed one. Intermountain Miracles, but we talk, we tell them about that because ours is a little bit more open and we don't have um, our sole purpose is just to give information and connect families to start um, to get support and such. So there's a few things that again to keep up with with them because we'll we'll advertise even on the Parent Center website support groups and as soon as we put them up they're gone. So we've tried to go to more of an online platform that um, others know about it. So if there are families that don't have access, that we're finding that many of our families do have access to their smartphones, even if they don't have a computer and such, and they, they are connecting with other families once they kind of get that, that, okay, this is a safe group. So that, and I'll continue to pass these out. This, there is also a link on the Utah Parent Center website for the Family Family Network to, to connect them in because families have become very resourceful in trying to find, you know, those supports and services while they're waiting for forever to get on to um, that specific Medicaid waiver. Great. I was wondering if there are CPs there's been actually a clinic that's been used to come. I know years ago it was. Anybody know? I'm not sure if I'm just saying where CP clinic was mentioned. So I think that there is, but I don't have to say that. I can try to find out. Because I was thinking if there was a CP clinic, either the coordinator that clinic was near sober, the social worker was like, through, with no for example, um, I had a craniofacial kid, and I called the craniofacial coordinator, and she said, oh, yeah, there's a support group. Here's how you get like that. So I was thinking maybe there's a Because I know years ago, <coughs> many years ago, I went and took two kids. That was so long ago. Trenton hospitals have, or used to have a Because I was thinking it was the trainers, mm -hmm. and that maybe that person I don't, not sounding like they're, you know, coming out of my brain, is I don't think there is, um, we you know, work with Shriners, we charge nation with them, and it just doesn't, I don't remember there being that. I don't think so. Um, and it's, if we don't have a, a condition specific clinic listed, a category listed as in the medical home portal, so I kind mean, of feel like there may not be, but we can uh, look into that. Well, another office to check out primarily is the neuroscience doctor's office with um, Dr. Sachnagar. Oh, or they do all the photos yeah. about the penal injections and things like that. So that would be another contact that they have some good info. You know, not just in generic teeth neuro. Mm -hmm.
may not be defined exactly as a safety clinic, but they used to set it up so that the surgeons there would see all children with CP on this particular Right, day. right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, um, I can get such a, Jill Connor um, is our contact there, and she'll answer that very quickly. Also, um, Utah State had quite a great program similar to that. But they do some great work up with their dogs, and it might not be that much different yeah. to get up to Logan. <coughs> Thank you. 
and say, hey, this is the range for the co-op. Yeah, and they, they can probably call it and get the billing code that we could use, and then with those billing codes, figure out what their insurance, what would be covered, and then call billing, and be like, this is typically what it is, what would we do? Yeah, and that would be helpful. Yeah, we're yeah. yeah. looking at the volume, the volume of the site, and then how we would do it. Yeah, before, yeah, before and after. So yeah, they can always call us, and we can get like the billing codes that we would use, and they can talk to their insurance, and talk to billing, and figure out what it would be prior to the appointment. So they're willing to call whenever. You know, I've noticed human nature too is if you go to the doctor and you get co-payment, you come back with diagnosis with the co-payment most span. But if you have to make pay for something that's like you don't have diagnosis back, then it's just gut wrenching. You have to have all that. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, Jade from UView Health Plan says. Uh, I think a lot of our members with CP attend the physical medicine and rehab clinic as their main specialist. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Jason, sorry, that was pretty good. Yeah, no, no worries. <laughs> Thank you for coming in. That's good. That's good. All right. Okay, well, I hope it's all right if I continue along because um, we have some other things we want to make sure we get to. But I will, um, I will uh, ask quickly if anyone's um, got any positive things to share regarding using motivational interviewing techniques or um, any quality improvement in your, in your organization that's paying off. I would like to hear the positive stories, so. though. Actually, I'm in the middle of a CUI right now. We have a child that was transferred, sorry, the word transitioned from um, primary children to South Davis. And I had done a care plan for both facilities for the last week that we knew, and these were the goals that we knew that needed to be met in order to get the child over there. But he was on a specialty medication and nobody addressed it. So when he got to South Davis, they didn't have it. And Premier Children's Pharmacy, with good reason, didn't want to give it up. It's not used in pediatrics very often. It's an adult medication that they use mostly for Huntington's. But anyway, so we have now collaborated um, and have added specialty medication to, I know, I know it seems really simple, but it's a very costly medication. It's a hundred bucks a pill, oh and that's after everything. And so, um, it's it, it was it's been a nightmare for this family and for South Davis since all of this went down. And so, I know that Primary Children's is working on their end, and I'm working on my end as far as management care management goes to add that to the list of check off things. So okay. it's just something that was not even considered or thought about. It was just something that was. Everything will move, and that's the way it is. But um, it's been a good one. Okay. So. All right. That's, that's actually helpful for the next part of our meeting. So thank you. And I'm happy to hear that. I hope it sounds like it's a little bit better for the family. Yes. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. All right. So next next part of our meeting. So um, we wanted to, to kind of circle back. Some of you might have been here in our January meeting where we talked a little bit about shared plans of care and what ideally would be on a shared plan of care from kind of your perspective, the care coordinator's uh, <laughs> And so I wanted, we wanted to circle back around to that, and I hope that you'll um, still indulge this a little bit in the next half an hour or so. But uh, before we jump into some of the particulars, and they'll have to do with a couple of the handouts that um, are over on that table if you didn't get these. Um, it'd be good to get a copy. Um, with a little bit of background, and so uh, Eric and Gina, please um, fill in any gaps and correct me where I did something wrong. But give you just a little bit of background on, on part of the reason that we're, we're working on this. Um, part of the reason we're working on this is that it's important and it's, it's happening in, in many, many places. The shared plan of care and care coordination and all of these terms are buzzwords right now and I'm sure many of you know. So I think it would have happened regardless. But we're excited that it's part of this grant that we're working on. And so um, we refer to the grant often as the D70 grant or the D70 project. That's kind of shorthand. 
the, the longer name for our grant um, that was awarded to the Bureau uh, is Utah's Enhanced Facility for Children and Youth with Special Health Training. So that's an mouthful. It makes that a little easier. And so we are just starting the third year of this grant. And we are, uh, it's a, a Maternal Child Health Bureau versa grant. It's a, a series of grants, but this one's a little different in that um, actually 16 states, including Utah, um, are working on the same three high-level goals. Uh, now, that was different in every state because of the nature of, of states um, you know, being so different. And, and you felt pretty different. Um, but we all have ultimately these goals that include um, a shared resource. And the idea behind a shared resource is um, really a, a place that families and those who care for children with special health needs can go to get information, to, get, um, to be connected potentially to services, supports, and specialists kind of a just-in-time, one-stop shop sort of thing. And so for Utah, that is the medical home portal. So that's our shared resource for children and youth with special health care needs and their caregivers. Um, another one of these high-level uh, goals has to do with shared plan of care. Now, um, a shared plan of care isn't defined very strictly, um, and I don't know that it should be, because uh, that really tells people they have to do things a certain way, and it may not work for them, and that they will not do it at all. So um, every state gets to figure out what a shared plan of care looks like for them. And in Utah, we recognize that that really comes down to every organization coming up with a shared plan of care that works in some way for them. But what we, as a, a team on this grant, have been trying to do is to come up with something that might be a starting point for groups. And so we're going to look at what we've come up with um, today. Uh, as part of um, this grant, we have a, an extended group of organizations who provide representatives come to quarterly uh, large team meetings, and then uh, a subset of those folks um, are part of work groups. And so we have some work groups um, looking at uh, some of these um, forms and, and having some of these discussions. So we want to show you what those work groups have been doing today. And the, the last uh, high-level goal um, for all these states is to really start to see some of this in action, to have some formal agreements between organizations to share information on children and see you know, that's starting to progress and hopefully have that grow um, with more agreements between um, more, more organizations. And so in Utah, what we've been doing is, is Eric's group, um, the Integrated Services group, uh, have a formal agreement with Up to Tree, which is the uh, early intervention group in Logan. And they are now trying to work together to um, have appropriate referrals uh, take place and share information in an appropriate fashion um, when, when it makes sense. Um, for kids who are seen by early intervention and who might need some care coordination uh, help that ISP can provide. And so ISP has, in fact, been starting to work um, with these forms. And we're, we're pleased about that because that means we'll get some real world uh, feedback on whether or not they're, they're doing the trick. So I wanted to give you that little bit of background. And then we wanted to kind of show you um, what, we've, what we've been working on as well. Big thank yous and big kudos because we uh, we are always so fortunate to be able to with Wasatch Pediatrics, uh, who is a little bit farther along than, than some of the rest of us in um, in this whole care coordination process sort of thing. And so the, the care coordination information checklist, which is a mouthful, and then I added Utah Pediatrics on the front to sort of make it ours, which is really long. You can call it whatever you want. But that's this one. Let's take a look at it. And this one um, actually came, um, the original version of it uh, came from um, Dusty. Came from Jenna via Dusty. <laughs> <laughs> Everything goes back to Jenna, let's go. Say it and give it up. Thank you for that. We're glad you're here today. Not sure why that isn't popping out. We'll just do it the long way. Uh, and so I'll, I'll actually show you how I'm, I'm finding it. So if you go into this, uh, section of the medical home portal, and then you come over here to care coordination for a partner state, and then this link here. This is that page that I was mentioning, and this is the URL that's on that little that card, which is right there. At the bottom of this page, we have these things. So here is the checklist, and it's a PDF. Um, if you like it in a word form format, I'm happy to get that to you. It just doesn't always translate beautifully into somebody else's computer version of Word or all things and all that stuff. So um, that's 
why we put it in PDF format for the, for the website. That I have it in Word. If you want to try and make changes, then you'll notice that it's one page. We were so proud of ourselves. Because <laughs> we, did, we did add some things to it. And then on the back, um, we just threw the word notes on there to encourage folks using it. <clears throat> this, could be, this is how you can keep it from one page, right? <laughs> so I um, just wanted to show you what, what we had been trying to do. And I hope you can see that. I don't know if you can see that. But the, uh, what we tried to do on here with this work group is to think of every single question that you might need to ask a family, recognizing that there will be families and situations where you won't ask the majority of these questions. This is that initial comprehensive assessment, right? This is that, that full blown one. And, um, and so again, wanting to encourage folks to think about how this works or doesn't work or would work or wouldn't work for your organization, and, and also understanding that um, this is a piece of paper, and you have to think about fitting it into your workflow somehow. So we, we love to hear, and this is the time, um, if you want to look through it and, and have your comments, we'd love to hear what you think about this. Um, in this work group, which included um, folks from the Medicaid Tech Waiver Program, the Crawford Relief Clinic, um, Jesse's on the work group, um, she figures, <laughs> um, and a number of other folks. Um, the, the conversation that we were um, trying to have was, you know, what what could we put on here that will um, check a, you know, something in our brain as the care coordinator, as the person that's talking with the family, to help you with the information from them that we need to have a whole picture. So, and then also to have it on one page. So that's this is what we came up with, and we tried to include things, you know, that that were maybe less medical in nature as well. Um, so it is it is a little bit cramped in there, but you can see the um, the questions on social and family changes. You can see the questions on family strength. Um, you can see the uh, the darker box in the in the center here that uh, this asking participants with. Um, it's got a number of things that um, are medical or medical in nature, but also have a different flavor. So. I was just thinking that um, some of this scaled down may be helpful at a well child visit for someone who doesn't have such auto care needs. Uh, if I know some of the NCQA requirements are, you know, kind of gathering that information about, you know, updating family situations and who are they seeing, and they may not qualify as needing a care coordinator for right. this patient, but they may have self-referred or gone to one specialist that may not be in the EMR or just, it, you know, anyways, uh, with less of the resources, that might be something to just update regularly for a well visit. Right. And one of the things that we're <coughs> hearing is that in order to, um, so we have a learning session that we have on October 12th, what, what we were hearing is that if you want to try and uh, integrate care coordination in your, your practice, that to find ways to fund that, might need to, need to implement things that help all your patients and all your families. And so I think that's a great idea. So if they have a version that um, a little scale down, maybe there's a couple of versions because as I mentioned, we think this is really comprehensive perhaps for that first one, but maybe you don't need all these questions subsequently. Um, so, you know, I don't know. As we take this form on the road, um, I know some providers, um, you know, just like my own personal doctors, are really great at talking and throwing stuff in on the computer. I get anxious, and if I type out something or if I did this double space or I did something weird, all of a sudden I'm focusing on the form and not the family. So it's been nice for me to have this piece of paper that I can write stuff down and much more easily able to engage with the family. I'm not stressed about technology, and then I throw that stuff into the computer after the fact. And it takes a little more time to do it that way, but it saves me. So for me, it's worth it to do it. Um, and we've not needed to ask all of this stuff. A lot of times, it's very specific to what the family needs right at this moment. And sometimes, if a family's been at the clinic for a while and they have an anxious kiddo, and it's lunchtime and everyone's hungry, it's a lot of stuff to go through. So sometimes we just use it for the nitty gritty, and then when the family has a little bit more time, we can follow up and um, fill out more details. 
started, I um, was going into rooms with just a blank sheet of paper um, because there was nothing in my practice for us to assess these kiddos. And so um, mine looks a little less cluttered <laughs> just because I like I need kind of compartments to keep my head around things. But all of this information, like, is great for an initial kiddo. And um, there is, like, there is a lot of things that you can pre-fill out even prior to go um, into the room. And that's, like, the one thing that I really like about it. So there's a template on our EMRs or pre-visit phone calls and things like that. Um, I was using this kind of as, like, pre-visit and then, you know, like, going into the room. So now that I have pre-visit and that's, like, established, I can print that out and that's available to everybody who works with that picture because it's now in the, um, in the chart. But this is like, okay, especially the follow-up plan like that came, this is like the 15th version of, you know, like the care, but the follow-up plan is like really good for care coordinators because then you can see like what it is that we need to do after we leave the room. And this has been like implemented in my practice for over a year now. And it has been so nice, especially like after I go in a room and finish the follow-up plan, I scan it and take the mark. The next time that patient comes in, I can go in and see exactly what it is that we did <laughs> when they were here the last time. And then like check on those things, build on those things, like um, having this like in paper form has been so helpful. Wonderful. Wonderful. Just one thing that's been really grateful. Um, I was thinking even for our family, we have to make changes on the health and having this filled out as part of the discharge plan for the use of all of care would be a great, a great thing to make sure that we can do So I I since Jen has developed it might be to in every patient I go visit with, and I end up with all my mental health kids, then I'm giving referrals to um, mental health therapists or you know whatever their next step is, and how we're following up on medication and what they need involved and what the family, you know, structure. The family strength part comes in really handy when you're kind of looking at what that family structure looks like and what kind of extra support they might need. Um, but I think that, and I skip people, but if I know a kid doesn't have any dreams, of course I'm not going to ask about that. But it has been really great so that I can, I'm not forgetting anything. You know, if, if I can scan through it and I don't have to read every single question, I can scan through it and say, oh, that doesn't apply. I know that doesn't apply. We'll see if that's ever So I guess what that means is you become familiar enough with your brain of this that you know where things are. And so if this is too much on one page, Jenna, how, how long is yours? Um, so I have a lot of the same, sorry, I'm just going to grab the one. <laughs> I have a lot of the same components, um, but it's still a page. Um, but probably the like, top part uh -huh. is a bit more condensed. The kind of the patient information? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I found, like, because I have access to, like, a demo sheet for them, like, I don't need to put, like, I felt like I was just kind of, like, reworking right. Right. the so, same stuff that we have over and over and over again. So um, this could be much, much reduced. Right. And they connect back to where you got all that. Right. Okay. And because it's all, like, linking into the same place, I scan this in, like, most of the information on, um, and just so that I make sure it's going to the right patient. Right. And that the contact information that I have for the parent is the best, absolute best way to contact the parent. I think that's really good feedback. I bet we could do, I bet we could reduce that quite dramatically and just look all of a sudden and feel better. <laughs> so. Well, you can also, if you have it in a Word document that you save or even in your EMR, if there's a way to auto-populate that top information where you save it in the file so that patient can see that has the information already typed in and you can update the bottom portion, then that would be really 
just bear in mind, you would be saying none of this is different in the way she did. Right. Okay, that's how I got. Yeah. So I don't I don't know about that, that auto population. That takes somebody with some kind of can I have? So one of the nice things about this floor when it is in the word um, form, you can have it on an iPad or whatever, and it has check boxes, so you can just tap those check boxes. I haven't used it that way, um, but we also have, you know, laptops we can take in or tablets that we can take in, or we can auto popular or you know, click those and print it out right and move it behind you. But I'm really old fashioned. <laughs> I have a condensed templated form of this, so if you were to type in, like, under primary caregiver, it's not going to move the rest of the format of the, um, so I don't personally type into it, but that's how it was initially created, was, like, to be able to type in, like, kind of like the, the care plan, so it doesn't, like, shift the entire format, like, what the change. I feel like you need to find someone who can pay you for every, you know, everybody's practice. I don't know how to, don't know how to make that happen. Um, that is great feedback. Um, I think I'm going to ask Pat Rowe, so you see the medications area here, mm -hmm. would there be somehow that you would recommend that we like, add something or do an asterisk or something on there for the specialty medications? Some sort of flag that, you know, is there a trickier one on here? Is there something that would require more attention? Um, in the box where you have others, uh -huh. I would put just the word specialty because that is, to me, that would break a flag. I mean, it, some people might, well, if they're not on an SSRI or if they're speech or medication, I mean, that, you know, I realize that this is a brief list. This is not the, you know, this is, I don't think this was created for kids that have. 13 medications at 8 and then 16 medications at 8 p.m., you know, kind of thing. But um, I would take the word out of there, and I would put specialty. Just because it doesn't always have to be that way, but if we think it's going to be hard to find or hard to get. It needs to be applied. Really quick, I had an appointment with my husband the other day at the Ramai Center, and he had something that gotten his eye and they have a care coordinator who does the intake and she asked him a bunch of questions and at the end she asked him three questions. I don't think I'm going to get them right, but they really got my ears perking up. One was, do you have any social or cultural beliefs that we need to know about to treat you appropriately? Something along those lines. They asked that. Um, another was, yeah, I want to go back and ask her, but one was, how do you learn best? The way you learn best, so she mentioned reading, she mentioned you know, seeing through digital images or doing. So I thought that was really interesting, and it, it made me wonder, I don't know that we, don't, that we need to get out that, that level at this point, but it made me wonder about, kind of, what about getting to the point where we can ask those kinds of questions, and doing all the rest so well? That was exciting. I think it would be related to not necessarily the child that was feeling direct, because we are going to be educating the hormone trying to get to that. There's a little different than that. Yeah. 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 But there's a conflict with that that I have found, like with the insurance requirements um, for care management, the questions you ask, and um, Don mentioned the NCQA, they have pretty stringent requirements that we're supposed to ask every child, well, uh, or every member, well, we're, we can't talk to the children. Um, by law without the parent being there, and they've got this very expensive depression questionnaire, and it is a member of blah, 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 it's a member, you know, that the member does it. And I finally, after about three weeks <laughs> in the job, I said, okay, am I talking about the member or am I talking about the parent? Because again, in pediatrics, the approaches are very different than what they are in adult settings. And it is a struggle, um, and so at what point do you say, does your child deal with depression, you know? And I had one mother comment, well, I've seen four-year-olds with depression. 
14 four year olds that are sad too, that have they been diagnosed with a depressive disorder or some kind of behavioral health or mental. The MCQA's guidelines are very, very strict and they have to be directed towards the child, not the parent. And I gotta tell you, I'm not the expert, but I totally and fundamentally disagree. Because it's not the child raising the child and caring for them, it's the caregiver. And if the caregiver is struggling with depression or anxiety or whatever, you can be well bet that the child is going to suffer as a result of that if the parent hasn't gotten under control. So I really struggle with that concept, and I don't know what right answers are, but I can't argue with MCQA, even though I probably would like to. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you can, but it's, it's therapeutic for me to say, you know, this is not what I consider to be a good tool for these reasons. Thank you for your input. You know, I mean, it's, I'd like to see how really do they reconcile those different Well, and they also open it up to um, input when they change their, their tools. Um, they've opened it up. Oh, well, that's people. good to know. Yeah, and, and the clinic I worked at, they gave input into it. So that happens sometimes, so don't just write it off. Talk, talk, talk. Nice to know. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Nice to know. Thank you. And I, and I think we will see progress on some of these ambiguity gray areas. I, I think we will. We're still kind of early stages in a lot of this, so we have to try and be patient. But also, don't forget about these things. And when is there opportunity to improve? But okay, so. Quickly, I want to show you the other form as well. So um, one of the things that our work group um, really did feel like we talked a lot about and into a, an agreement on was that there really are two processes going on, or two things that need to happen with um, uh, you know, the care coordination process. And one is assessment, and that's the, the form we were just looking at. And then when there are action items as a result of asking all those questions on the checklist, and that's where you get into planning care, right? So if you're looking at this thing and we're all good, no, no worries here, then, you know, is there a real need for this? Okay. Just kind of long and double entry again to some degree and, and so on and so forth. So, so our feeling was if you've got something that you can refer to on a regular basis, so, you know, maybe there's a, a version of this that you look at, um, or you get so good that you know how to actually move through it really quickly for, for those, um, those visits. But when there's an action item here that's indicated, then it transfers to, to the care plan. And so um, I wish there was a way to have it just be seamless. And maybe there will be someday, and that's certainly our goal, um, is to get to a point okay, where every EMR can somehow do all of this beautifully and we'll share it. But uh, what, what we felt is that right now there is a need for two separate things. And if this is not if it's the case for you, you know, go for it. But that's why we've got the two separate forms. And again, this came from Jenna. And Jenna, I did go through and get rid of a lot of those fancy special population links because they didn't make sense to try and put out there when they didn't get anything else. But Jenna's version of this is such that a lot of this is pre-populated or has drop-downs that she can choose from that are specific to her clinic and what they do. And maybe we need to have a class on how to do that. But this is, this is um, all these gray uh, areas here. It's just a, a text field where you would have to then enter. What we've done on this is um, shown how we changed it in red. Clearly that's probably not what you want in your own, but we did want to show you how it has been um, modified. And uh, one of the, the goals of this, again, is so that anything you put on this can have a follow-up here. And so, Jenny, you were talking about the follow-up plan. Is this what you're calling a follow-up plan? This is more for my, so once I've gone through, so let's say, like, no patient in practice, right? You've never seen this scale before. I would do a care coordination immediate actionable goals I put on the bottom of the care coordination assessment, which for like follow-up. And but this I look at more long term. So um, this in my like vision of <laughs> care coordination was the parent can take this and do this kind 
because I'm like a medical, I so it is more um, like it helps guide our practice in accommodating that patient, helps our practice know what actionable items we're responsible for um, for that patient's care, but also helps the parent know um, kind of have just like what's going on with that kid for that year with their medical. So that, that kind of was like a more long term. Um, if there's like immediate actionable items, I suppose there's like different ones. And so you have a, a flow. Like yeah. You're good at now. You've gotten it figured out and you adhere to it. And I think that's one of the hardest parts about all of this. That when I start to try and walk the steps in my own mind and, and I don't I don't even do this, but I start to imagine what you guys must go through because you've got, you know, in, in a different EMR likely in, in many cases, and you've got expectations for what happens when you see a family and all of that. How you fit this all in, that's really the breaking point. We can we can revise and change and make available as, long, as much as we want, but if they don't work for you in your workflow, then that's, that's not, it's just not going to happen. We get that. So, you know, I think Jenna probably has a fair amount of experience. Summit, Dusty, and Liz would be great people to, to probably talk with as well about how you thought about trying to incorporate these um, tools to, to work within your setting and for your family and for your practice. Um, and I'm not going to show the spot uh, other than mention that we do have folks here who are uh, maybe a little farther along and I think would be willing to answer questions about how you then take the tools to that. That's how we are. You know, it's the wrong tool. Okay, awesome. On um, we're running out of time, but I would, I would like to ask um, that we would love your input and feedback on, on this. Um, if you're interested in potentially trying to maybe use this in your clinic, we would love to know that, and we would love to hear how it goes. So that's part of the goals of this grant, and it's part of, you know, it doesn't matter when the grant ends, this, these are goals for our state is that we would like to find a way to start um, gathering information that can be shared appropriately with, with eventually all members of the care team. Um, perhaps at first what this really comes down to is something that we share with the family. And if this could be something that aids them and helps them and guides you, that's tremendous. That's a great first step. But ultimately, of course, we want all of these um, care team members that are on here to be uh, able to see the stuff as well appropriately, you know, at, at the right time and the right amount. And um, to that end, we are also investigating what the options are in Utah right now. Try and uh, find a common platform electronically to share information. And this is no small task. Um, uh, there, there are things that are happening in certain EMRs that might help with that, but unless we're all working on the same EMR, that's not that's not going to really do it. But we started looking at what does exist out there, and um, and there really are things that are, are happening, so there is hope. Um, but one of the things that we've looked into and I got excited about for a couple of reasons is um, the fact that the, the charm exists, and um, it's it's really and Christine's going to come and show it to us. But it's, it's really a, an opportunity to access information that's in a variety of databases um, having to do with children's health in the state. It's not going to have any child's information in there, but as more and more people start to use this and more and more organizations start to use that, there will be more. And we are hopeful that we can have more um, interest in it and use of it. And so I really was hoping that Christine would come today and, and show you what it is so if you're not familiar with it, you can think about, wow, would that be something that my organization might like to, to access and what it is, so what do I need to do that? And if you get to that point, so the number of in that statement, but we would love to again hear your thoughts on how is this working with your processes and your workflow and, and you know, what can we continue to do to help make this robust and work for more and more folks in the state of Utah. So with that, um, we'll see if we can do a little bit of a transfer. Uh, this is an opportunity, if you haven't filled out all of your contact info on that little half page for us, you could be doing that. You could get a donut. 
how we're doing this. You could um, get a bathroom break. Uh, hopefully this will just be a little train.
Let me see if hers comes up once. It's not on my but I should be able to. Okay. I manage the charm program at the Utah Department of Health. And I want to thank Eric and Mindy for inviting me here today to talk a little bit about charm and give you an overview. Uh, and I will start by giving you an overview and then switch to a live demonstration of our charm web interface. So once we get this I got one that says use EOH. Okay. That's what they have to supply. Yes, I'm And then we also have uh, 
a hearing screening alert where we're able to send a hearing screening alert to our vital records program. So when a parent goes into the birth certificate office to obtain a birth certificate, if the child is in need of a hearing screening test, uh, when that birth certificate clerk pulls up the child's birth, birth certificate, a pop-up window will pop up saying, oh, this child needs a hearing screening. And what she'll do then is print out a letter that has been drafted and written by the hearing screening program. And she hands that to the parent along with the birth certificate and says, you know, please contact this number on this, you know, this letter if your child may be in need of a hearing screening test. And uh, what we've been able to do is last year, um, there were 449 alerts that were generated for children by the CHARM system. And 74% of those were able to be followed up on the hearing screening test because of, of that alert. And our Baby Watch Early Intervention Program uses um, hearing screening alerts, a hearing screening result to get back from our system, as well as immunization information. And that just helps them with more comprehensive service and treatment plans. And then we have, besides doing integration within the Department of Health and between our programs, we also have a charm link actually right in uses for all the users that, that use that. And if they click on that button, they can get the newborn hearing screening results. And there's about 8,000 active users now of, of the immunization registry. So all those users would have access to hearing screening results. And then we have a charm web interface. And this is for a program med clinic. And on this web interface, uh, you can get the newborn screen hearing results, the newborn screen health sick results, and the immunization histories. And this is what I wanted to demonstrate to you in just a, in just a couple minutes. But the, the folks that are using this are in the Foster and Healthy Children program, the Our Health Six program, our WIC program started to use it uh, in a few of their sites, and then the U of U Pediatric Clinic. North Austin Clinic, Holiday Pediatrics, and Southbridge. So now I'll show you a little bit. It's just a tiny bit. Our, our one person on the other end is not hearing you quite as well. And she's doing okay, but a little bit louder might be. So this is our charm web interface, and when you get into the system, you'll first have to log in and register, and I'll show you that screen after, but because I'm already a registered user, after I log in, I'm brought right to this search for a child screen. So on this, usually the minimum search criteria is uh, to search by child's first name, last name, and date of birth. And if you can't find it on those three, then there's um, asterisk by the mother's first name. You can put in the mother's last name or maiden name. And you can narrow down your search to try to find that child. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate entering in a child. And once, once that is in, you can click the search button up here. And yeah, internet connection first thing is the problem two. That's a, here, let's try this hard slide. It seems like you're it's kind of wide by hand. Yeah. 
Well, that's coming up. So you talked about organizations that connect to it with their database and other organizations that can access the information from those first groups. Yeah. So, so it's a program within the Department of Health that actually integrated and then other organizations can, can access through the Department of Hey, um, do you want to try my hotspot on the iPad? Um, it's got four bars. Well, well then we'd have to um, jump on to go to meetings. Oh, gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, we might need to, but the pain. Do the children's names drop out when they reach a certain age automatically? Yes. Yeah. Once you can um, you can print this 
out. And um, you can either just print out only the newborn hearing screening result, or you can print out everything together, the newborn hearing screening, the blood spot, the results, or the immunization. Yeah. So the registration will be used as link for so all of this. So because the practice has the UCIS capabilities, the link built within UCIS will they have all of this or only immunization? No. So so this term with interface, you can access immunization results, hearing screening results, and telescope results. If you are already using UCIS in a clinic, if you're from a clinic and you're already using UCIS, the information you can get there is just hearing screening results. We are looking into adding the critical congenital heart defect results to that and eventually the health sick results. But right now, we can only get the newborn hearing screening results if you're in the new system already. So, and then it will just show you the hearing screening results and where it was done and the type of test that was done in OAE test and then um, this just shows a little bit of, of immunization history too. You know, a lot of pediatrician offices, you know, when you call and it says, you know, if you want immunization, records, whatever, you know, click here, whatever. Does this, in, does this help streamline the pediatrician processes when they, a parent can just go into this and, and get this information? So parents don't have access to it. Oh, no. Okay. Um, but, but clinics do. But when we, we, we piloted this at the University of Utah, we did find that it did help um, reduce duplicate tests and kind of, you know, help streamline the workflow. And they were able to, you know, since they had the hearing screening results, they were able to send the child right up to get further audiological testing when the child needed it. So they didn't have to wait, find out those results, and then have somebody come back. So um, it, it was very helpful for them when we, we had piloted with them a few years ago. So, and there's still some yes. Yeah. So this just shows you um, further hearing screening history results and immunization history for a child here. <laughs> and then this is the, um, if you were to click on the health sick results, you'd get the first specimen and the second specimen uh, results for child. And it gives you, you know, where the, it was collected at. This, this child was at the University of Utah Hospital and the date that it was done and, and collected. So it will just give you all that information right there. And um, so when I just talked about it, it eliminates duplication of hearing training services at the pediatric clinic when we use this and um, change some of the workflow there. Um, and so we did find that, of course, effective data sharing helps reduce duplicate tests and expedite appropriate referrals, services, and follow-up. And we would like to expand this and add the CPHD results, like I mentioned, and have more organizations and use it. Uh, we'd like to, um, I already talked about expand, what we're planning to do on expanding more information and adding that uh, more information to the term button and use it. And um, just would like to integrate more programs so that then we're able to provide more data to, to clinics. And one clinic had mentioned that getting um, early intervention information would be helpful. And, you know, we can't provide too much just because of their purpose, purpose laws, but we could provide enrollment days. And they said even that would be helpful for them. So, so there are some things that we're looking to do, and if there's anything else that you guys think would be useful, I'd like to hear from you too, if, and if you would need any other information from the Department of Health that could be shared or added to the web interface, if you were to 
treatment. So um, think about that if there is something else. It can take more questions at this time. So the clinic is interested in getting access to the web interface. Can they just contact you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I have a sheet I can pass these around if you're interested. You can sign up on the I wish that, you know, it's always iffy with a live demo. Yeah. <laughs> but if the connection would work, it looked like it was working. So, but at least you were able to see the screenshot and the kind of information that it could provide for you. So, and what I had in, in my head is that maybe if you were able to come in here and access the information that's currently available, if some of that would be helpful to help fill out you know, some of your your forms in your workflow, then you could at least cut and paste, or in some cases, you know, it would be as simple to just quickly type that piece in, as it were, but this would be an opportunity to, again, get accurate information where it's available from an authoritative source um, versus hoping that you get it right to questions or not getting it in a timely fashion, that sort of thing. So, Sounds like you know it's at the beginning still, but um, with input from folks, particularly like you, um, that might drive uh, further expansion in certain directions and um, and feedback. I mean, just like what we want, that's what the team wants to, to improve the system. So, you guys think that might be something that your practice would be interested in? Sounds like getting access is relatively straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, you just contact me and then uh, I give you the, the you, you log into the URL, the Tumblr interface URL, and then you can download uh, the provider agreement, the user agreement, and complete those for your office, and then you send them in, and once I receive them and all the users, then um, your users can start to register, can go in and register, and then I get an email back saying that a charm user is waiting to be approved. And so I'll go in and look and see who that is, and then I just go in and approve, approve them. And I match it up with their with the user agreement form. There is not access. No. You know, the thing that um, some of the programs give you kind of flag when I'm trying to answer the first person. Like for the yeah, yeah. So we right now we have hearing screening alerts in there, and if a child has passed away, um, a, a death alert would appear to show up. So I'm just wondering if that would be something that we would be able to see. A child with intervention. With the interface, you could, you know, it would show you if the child has a hearing screen alert, but we probably have to be connected directly with the able to do that kind of alert with the early intervention. Christina, I threw a little picture on there so we can talk about working up in various services and how we can do toy with it a little bit tonight, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can kind of look at what would be useful information to share and how we can make that happen. Yeah, and things are, because I had you listed, but I, I didn't talk about all the programs. But yeah, we're looking at, at um, connecting and, and integrating with integrated services and the Utah Birth Defects Network uh, more and helping them get information from Baby Watch as well, the AG, and, and vital records information. So, so we, we've been in discussions with other programs too. Any other questions? Well, I really appreciate the, you know, having, you know, having me here, asking, I mean, you asked me here today and, and being here with you today. So, um, again, if you're interested, just contact me and, and we'll get you signed up. And we'll send Christine's contact information out with the, 
the summary that we can do. So you can you think about it when you can get it down, get back to where. So thank you again. I think we managed to get recordings of the screenshot. So so that's what I was hoping for. And we you know we record this meeting and put it out there for people to look at. So that's an opportunity for them to see a little bit of how it works, which is what we were hoping for. I think okay. that's I'll be in the presentation as well, but so, I can get that available as well. That's, that's terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, guys, so don't forget to, to get your parking validation so you can get out of here. And um, certainly more information coming shortly, but I think you can stay through around on a December 21st. Okay, so have a happy and safe Thanksgiving, everyone. And um, take it very for the